Okay. There you go. There we go. All right. Amen. All right, guys. I want you to relax. All right. Don't worry about it. Yes, it's a blessing of marriage. But you know, the blessing of marriage is supposed to be full of joy unspeakable. Okay, so you, you got, everybody just relax. It's a beautiful day. All right? Take a deep breath. You're all doing good. You look beautiful. All right, but we're going to talk about the covenant of the blessing today. Let's look at this. We're going to talk about things in this uh, preparation for the blessing. The, the blessing will start, commence at 11 or around that time. Okay? But we're going to do something that's absolutely, that has not been done. Which is, we're going to talk about the inner workings of marriage absolutely clearly today. We're going to talk about the three-day ceremony publicly today. Okay, this is a ceremony that many, even blessed children, have never heard of. You have never heard, many of you, many of us, who have been grown up in the church, have not heard what the three-day ceremony comprises of. What is this thing? And a lot, a lot of people in the church who have undergone the three-day ceremony have almost become shy of it. Amen. Right? And this is what is so important in this hour. As Father has now ascended and the Holy Spirit is dwelling with us, we must not be like the children of Noah, who when they saw their father's nakedness was ashamed. Amen. And tried to cover him. Right? So as the hierarchical church that is following a false covenant is ashamed of father, ashamed of the different uh, uh, ceremonies that we have had, it is so important that the children of God do not sh be ashamed of their father. Amen? It is so important. That is the right artistic posture that we must have before God. Right? And this is what's so important. That's why we need to today clearly talk about things such as the three-day ceremony. We're going to actually go through the three-day ceremony, each one of the steps of the three-day ceremony, the significance of the three-day ceremony. We're also going to talk about food today. How many know in marriage, food is a very important thing? Yeah, Lisa, okay. There you go. <laughs> you know, right? Food is a very important thing. And then we're also going to talk about what? Sex. We're going to talk about sex. Because in the church, the body of Christ, listen, the body of Christ does not talk about the holiness of sexuality. It does not. It has become shamed by the fallen culture, and that is why our fallen culture is educating our children on sex. Where it should be the parents in a godly home, and it should be the pulpit where we also can teach about the sanctity of marriage and the sanctity of intimacy in marriage. Amen? Amen? This is something, of course, which is core to the principle, and it is core to Father's teaching. How many know that when you're in the presence of Father, He would talk so openly about intimacy in marriage? Even if there's grandchildren around, He had no shame because that was... God prepared the covenant of marriage. That's where the grandchildren came from. How many know that's where the grandchildren came from? <laughs> right? But we have become ashamed because we have become dominated by the satanic culture and fallen culture around us. And thus we cannot talk about in the churches about the sanctity of sexuality in the covenant of marriage. Amen? So we're going to get into that today. Okay? So we're going to talk about those things. We're going to talk about the lineage and spiritual positions, the three-day ceremony for the first time in public. What a glorious day. The archangels cannot try to hide this anymore. It is such a beautiful... When I was studying this, see, as blessed children, we didn't have to go through it. But when I was studying it to teach it, some, it was so powerful. It was so beautiful to see this. 
I mean, even just to understand this as a blessed child. We, as a blessed children, we don't have to participate in it, but to understand it. The incredible a ceremony that the three-day ceremony is. I was so moved looking and studying through this, this ceremony. We're also going to cover barbecue and recipes today. But it's not what you think. It's not what you think. And we're going to talk about the importance of sexuality in marriage. How critical that is to your blessing. Amen? All right, let's look at the three-day ceremony. Due to the fall, you know what we do? Let's read this together. Due to the fall, God's blood lineage was lost to the dominion of Satan. Mankind must be restored unto God the Father and Christ, the Son of God. The Messiah is the bridegroom and must meet his bride. A blessed couple is in the position of a bride who has been wed to Christ. Specifically, the wife stands in the position of fallen woman or Eve, and the husband stands in the position of fallen archangel. Christ stands in the position of the perfect man and the perfect Adam. Through the three-day ceremony, the wife is reborn in Christ as the restored bride of Christ and is bestowed to the husband as a princess in the kingdom of God. The husband is reborn in Christ as a son of God, so from the archangel to the son, a prince of the kingdom of God. After the completion of these holy consecrations, the husband and wife will stand as a prince and princess of God's kingdom to glorify and honor him forever. Amen. Let's give God some praise for that. This is the engrafting into the royalty, the royalty of God. Amen. The royal family. We have a, now, we're, before those who are first getting blessed and are going to do the three-day ceremony, uh, if you are sort of what we call first generation, if you're receiving the blessing for the first time, we are encouraging you to do a 40-day celibacy separation period. 40 days. You have to hold, have dominion over the flesh for 40 days. This is a symbolic offering. It's like a fast, right? We don't, this does not purify us, but it shows, it gets us out of the way so God can prepare us. Amen? And this 40-day period, of course, we see through the scripture in the Old Testament where God destroys the earth with water. He brings rain for 40 days and 40 nights. Moses flees. 40, 40, it flees to Midian, 40 years in the desert. Mount Sinai, 40 days, 40 nights. Interceding on Israel's behalf for 40 days, 40 nights. The law specifying a number of lashes, 40 as the maximum. The Israelite spies looking for 40 days to spy out Canaan. The Israelites wandering for 40 years, right? And so on and so forth. Samson's deliverance. Goliath taunting Saul's army for 40 days. Elijah fleeing from Jezebel, traveling 40 days. The New Testament, Jesus is tempted for 40 days and 40 nights. The 40-day period is a separation from Satan period. It's a time of like spiritual fasting where we are internally separating from Satan's covenant. Okay? The three-day ceremony will then commence after the 40-day period. So after the 40-day period of purity, the three-day ceremony will commence. And the three-day ceremony, uh, after we come, we come in, coming and receiving uh, uh, prayer for the 40 days of uh, victory of separation from Satan, and then you will enter into the three-day ceremony. And I want to go through this 
very detailed with you because those who have done the ceremony, you will remember it. But those who have never heard of this, like blessed children, it's so powerful to understand what type of covenant we exist under. Amma, if I could ask you to come. So this is the three-day ceremony. The three days symbolize the old, the new, and completed testaments. Okay? The three days also symbolize formation, growth, and perfection. The stage of growth at which Adam and Eve had fallen and lost perfection. Lost God's ideal in the kingdom. Okay? So on the first day, on the first day, there is preparation before the actual ceremony commences. Okay? And that would be holy salting the bedroom. Holy salting the bedroom. Purifying it with prayer. Okay? Also with holy salt. We'll place true parents' picture in an appropriate location in the bedroom. And we will light the holy candle before that. Okay? Then there will be a holy washing ceremony where the couple's husband and wife will bathe, clean themselves, their bodies. And then they will use a clean towel or the holy towel or their holy kerchief. You will use that to wipe symbolically your body. Something like this. You will designate that and then you'll wash your body symbolically. Okay? Then you will, you have to, well, there will be a separate towel. Okay? And the, then you will dry your body with a regular towel. But that holy kerchief will remain for the three days. After that point of washing, we will put on our clothes and formal clothes. We will bow to true parents and we will recite the family pledge. All these things will be put up, where's Tim, will be put up on the website for you to be able to download so you can then recite the family pledge, which is pledging our families to the building of the kingdom. Okay? Now, here is where powerful things happen. On the first day, look at this, the first day, the husband will do three full bows to his wife. How many knew that? How many is hearing this, hearing this for the first time? Okay. On the first day, the husband will do three full bows. What is a full bow? A full bow is a bow like this, on the knees and to the ground. Okay? That's a full bow. Three full bows symbolizing the different levels of growth within the formation stage. Okay? So in the formation stage, there is formation, growth, and perfection stages within that one stage. So on the first day, the husband will bow three times to his wife. In this posture, the husband will realize that he represents the fallen archangel. He is the fallen archangel, and he has to humble himself to Eve. Because in the garden, he seduced Eve and fully beguiled her and brought her and Adam under his yoke of slavery. This is the path of breaking that bond with Satan, not only with spiritual salvation, but as Paul prophesied, that when the Lord returned, that we are waiting for the adoption of the body, that God must also claim the physical body or the resurrected body, and that must be totally pure and separated from Satan. So the husband will bow to the wife three times, full bows, symbolizing the fallen archangel. And the wife, in the position of fallen Eve, prays for the husband to be reborn. She has to pray in the position of fallen Eve to, to ask God that her husband would be reborn. That he would, the archangelic dominion would leave him. And that he would be, okay, reborn as a son of God, yes. 
Okay, so we'll pray together like that. Okay, so right hand over the left and my wife's right hand over my left. Like that. Okay? After that prayer is given, and the, the wife will pray on that first day. The wife will pray. After she has received the three bows from her husband, the wife will pray. And then the husband and wife will have sexual intercourse with the wife in the top position. In the top position. How many heard this for the first time? Okay, there you go. In the top position. Because what happened? She came under the dominion of Satan, right, in the fall. Eve came under the dominion of Satan. And she became his object, or he be she became his slave. So she became under him. So in the restoration of the formation stage and the old covenant, Eve not, must stand as the victor. So she must stand in position above the archangel. Okay? And that's why in the, that first night of intimacy, the wife will be on the top position, symbolizing the restoration of that fallen uh, process. After that is completed, the husband and wife will put on their clothes and bow. The husband then again bows to the wife. You see, on the first day as the archangel, he has to show subjugation. To the, to, to the child of God. And people thought father was a chauvinist. What a fool. How many times you got to bow to your wife? Right? And then the husband will bow to the wife again. And then the wife will report to God and will pray thanking him for the success of the first day restoration symbolically of the formation stage or the Old Testament age era. So all of providence, all of the 6,000 years of biblical history are coming to culmination in your blessing, in your marriage. It's not just boy meets girl, girl meets boy, boy likes girl, and they live heavily after, heavily, I mean, hev happily ever after and fight every day. That's not what it's about. All of providence is condensed into this initial stage. Okay? The second day is a repeating of the first day. But this time, it is symbolizing the indemnity of Jesus not obtaining his bride because of the faithlessness of the people. They murdered him. Right? Right? So the second day will be a repeat of the first day, but now in a different position, symbolizing that indemnity that must be paid of the archangelic peoples who did kill Jesus. So this will symbolize the New Testament age. The third day will be symbolizing the full and completed restoration of what man and woman were supposed to be. Okay? The full restoration of man and woman. On this day, the husband, now, on the third day, the husband will symbolically walk the path of true father, restoring the dominion of fallen man. Now, husbands, on the third day, you are walking in symbolic footsteps of true father restoring fallen man. You see? You will do the holy washing ceremony as done on the second and th uh, first day. You'll, uh, again, repeat the wear clean clothes and bowing to true parents, reciting family pledge. But on the third day, the husband and wife will face each other now. On the previous two days, the husband is bowing to the wife, right? On the third day, the restoration of manhood, true manhood, right? The subject position is being restored. So they will bow to each other on the third day, facing each other, three bows to each other. 
And then on the third day, the husband will pray. The husband will pray. Thanking God for restoration of manhood, true manhood. True manhood. A manhood that has accepted the responsibility and has repented for the sin. Amen? The wife prays after him, thanking God for the restoration of man. In this position, the wife is also praying for the in repentance of her sin and at the same time thanking God for restoring her husband. After that, husband and wife will have intimate, sexual intimacy again. But on the third day, the man will be in the top position, symbolizing the restoration of man. Okay? And the restoration of the subject position. After this, the body will be cleaned with the same holy towel that you have been using throughout the three days. And this would preserve as the family treasure. This will be preserved because this, this signifies now the new ancestry. We may think family treasures are this or that, but this, your original ancestors and what they passed down, how they now birthed you and upon what covenant you are birthed is the treasure, amen? So we cannot just look at it from a boy meets girl perspective. We got to look deep into the historical context, how the descendants will be impacted by the covenant, by the blessing, by the removal of Satan and the total dominion of God being wed to Christ as a bride. The husband and wife will put on clean clothes. And on the third day, the wife will bow to the husband. The wife will bow to the husband. Full bow to the husband. The wife will bow to the husband. And then the husband will pray to God, thanking God for completing the three-day ceremony and vowing, both of them, vowing absolute fidelity, loyalty, and faith. Amen? Now, even though you're second gen and you don't have to do this, do you see how deep this is? Right? Right? Do you see how much you can learn from the posture and so, so much, so much, there's so much depth in our blessing. Okay. So that's the first stage. That's the first three-day ceremony. We will have that up for you. Uh, where's Mr. Elder? We'll have that up for you on the website and different you know, social media. So you can download that and then have those things so that when you actually do the three-day ceremony, after the 40-day separation period, that you will be victorious in, that, in the ceremony. Now, if for any physical reason the couple is not able to accomplish this within the three-day ceremony, within three consecutive days, they may try again as they are physically capable, because we get that question all the time, okay, as you are physically capable, but you must not try, you know, do, you, uh, Father said we must do it on three different days. So don't try to just, you know, rush it. Try to get it done in one day. You're healthy, you can get it done in one day. But don't try that, okay? Three consecutive days representing the three ages, okay? The three stages for mission, growth, and perfection. All right, now. Now we're going to go also to the scripture. And this scripture makes people mad, but we got to deal with it because it's the word of God. Amen? Okay? We can't just ignore it. So I'm going to read this whole scripture. We're going to read from 21, and we're going to go to 2033. But let's read together. 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourself to your own husbands, as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, 
of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Amen. Now, before all, all the men start celebrating and say, woohoo, submit. No, before you start doing that, look at what the scripture says. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's the key. We submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. What you do not want in your blessing, your marriage, is a power struggle. Amen? A power struggle will destroy your marriage because the devil will get in it and tear you apart. That's why God sets up the structure. And that's why God already gives us the model for what he intends. Okay? Wives, we, wives, we are supposed to submit to our husbands as we do to Christ. Okay? How the church submits to Christ. And at the same time, husbands, we are to love our wives just as Christ loved the church. Well, how much did he love the church? So much that he died. Right? You're talking about absolute sacrifice, going to the death. That is what we're called to do as husbands. Real men and husbands. Now look at this, verse 26. This is very important. Many husbands like the scripture on the wife has, uh, now that as a church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands and everything. Yeah, bring out the football and the whatever. No. Look at, look at what the scripture says, men. How are you to be real men? You are to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with the water, but through the word. How many of you men are studying the scripture daily? How many? Real men have to be studying the scripture. You are called to be the priest of your household. If you are not studying scripture, you are not a real man. You have to study the scripture. You have to be the priest of the house. Look at what it says. You have to wash her through the word. We're supposed to wash our spouse in the word. This is not a message of condemnation, amen, right? You guys see it in the word. You're supposed to be the priest. So men, this is our calling. We have to be the priest of the household. We have to walk with her, deal with her with the word. Not just our opinions or our feelings, but we have to deal with our wife with the scripture. We have to lead the household, amen? So this is an important part of manhood restored in the blessing and in marriage. Husbands are called to be the priest. You are called to study and to wash your spouse in the word. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? That's what we're called to do. We're called to love her by the word of God. Okay? So we have to study our Bibles. To study the principle, the Chun Sang we have to study the scripture and we have to encourage, especially our wife, with the word of God. It's not only about beautiful romantic words that we say to her. Our marriage is not only a boy and a girl loves each other. That's not what marriage is about, folks. Right? It's not about it's not about you, right? It's not about you. Your marriage is about God. Right? But how many of us want to get married for, for us, right? And you won't have a lot of preachers tell you that it's not about you. Marriage is not about you. It is about the everlasting covenant with God. That's what it's about. So I want to I wanna challenge you to get this on the inside of you. Because if this is challenge you, that's good. Because that's the Holy Spirit convicting you in a good way. This is a good thing. Okay? So we want to wash her, we want to breathe the priest of the house. We have to wash her with water, encourage her through the word, strengthen her with the word. Just as we would uh, uh, strengthen our congregation with the word, we also have to strengthen, encourage, enable, increase, 
empower our wife with the word of God. Okay? That is so important. Let's read from 28. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. There's the key to marriage, folks. There's a key right there in the, in the Word of God. It's right there. Right there at the end, we will see. Husbands, Paul's talking to the husbands. We are supposed to love our wife. Look at this. Does it say, uh, I recommend that you love your wife? Does it say, uh, I would hope you love your wife? Does it say that? What does it say? You must love your wife. You know what? In the Greek, this is agape love. This is unconditional love. Because when you get married, you'll quickly realize that sometimes your wife is unlovable. How many can say amen to that? <laughs> don't lie, don't lie. <laughs> Repent right now. Rebuke that devil right now. Sometimes your wife can be unlovable, but you are called to unconditioned love her. Okay? Now, I know, now, now be, women, before the ladies start celebrating, <laughs> what is the end of that scripture? And the wife must respect the husband. This, in the Greek, is the word uh, phobe, phobeo which also means unconditional respect. Unconditional respect. How many know that when you get married, sometimes your husband is unrespectable? You will feel like, I cannot respect this man. Raise your hand. Says, no, don't raise your hand. <laughs> you will sometimes face a man in your house, and he is your husband, who is totally unrespectable in your view. Just like he will also face a woman who is his wife at some times who is totally unlovable. Amen. Now usually before we do the blessing or you hear marriage counseling before marriage, you'll only hear the first part. You will only hear, men, you have to love your wife unconditionally. Right? Right? And we have to, as husband and wife, love each other unconditionally. There are so many studies showing now, and this is a great, um, there's great teachings on this by Emerson Egrich, pastor uh, Egrich. And he shows studies that have proven that women need love to feel respected. And they need love to feel valuable. How many women can agree with that? Right? Now, it doesn't mean they don't need respect, but they need love as their primary source of food. Okay? Now, there's also other studies that show men care not necessarily to be loved. Men desire respect. They desire respect. In a study where men were asked, would you rather be alone and... Um, you know, not disrespected, or would you rather be disrespected in a rela relationship? What would you choose? They chose, I'd rather be alone. They chose, I'd rather be alone. Men in their created being need to feel respect, to feel loved. See how different that is, folks? It's different, isn't it? Women need to feel loved 
to feel respected. Men need to feel respected to feel loved. So in your blessing, in your marriage, it is so critical. Hang on this word. Love and respect. It's all about loving and respecting. That is what we're not, in, we're not suggested to do that. We are commanded to do that by God. Amen. We're commanded to do that. That means when the husband is in his shorts or in his boxers eating popcorn, watching football, screaming at the TV, he looks totally unrespectable. Okay? You can see uh, what is that fool doing? We got so many things to do around this house. What is he doing? You may feel that this man is unrespectable, but the word of God commands you to have unconditional respect, to approach him with respect. Amen. Not to approach him, you good for nothing fool, get him. Pull out the TV and throw it and throw it out the window. That's not how you're called to behave. Okay? When your wife is nagging you about something and it doesn't stop and you already did it, but it still continues on. <laughs> I can see some of you smiling. <laughs> you are called to unconditionally love her. You don't change her by shouting out, or what men usually do is ignore her. They will ignore her. Because it's driving them crazy, and they will just go out the house. They will say, I can't, I can't handle this. They will just leave the house. Okay? So it's important, this is what, this is what is the crazy cycle in our marriages. This is what I call the hell cycle. How many know that your blessing can build either the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of hell? I know so many people who have received the covenant of the blessing, yet their marriages are hell. They're hell. Because they are not told about the scripture and they don't obey the scripture. God gives us the pattern of how to create success in our marriage. Power, anointing. Greatness in our marriage, but we have to obey the word. Amen. Not our feelings Not our emotions We have to obey the word This is the hell cycle folks You see because without love if she, if our wife does not feel loved she will react without respect if she doesn't feel like we value her and we have not, and she doesn't feel like she's loved, she will act disrespectfully. She will start seeing us as a child which needs to be disciplined. <laughs> Why are you laughing, man? <laughs> she will see you as a child to be disciplined. And who, what godly man wants to be treated like a child who is to be disciplined by his wife? What, who, who likes that? Do you like that, man? You can be honest. We're all bald here. <laughs> no godly man likes that. No godly man likes that. We do not like to be treated like children. We are grown men. Even though sometimes, you know, they watch in their boxers the, the sports and they scream at the TV. Okay? Love covereth all sin. If we love our spouse, those sins are covered. Look at this. Without love, she reacts without respect. He feels disrespected. He's going to react without love. He's going to ignore her. It's your third book of uh, uh, ways to improve your marriage. A third one that now you're saying, huh, you know, uh, Jimmy, we should read this. It's really going to be exciting to read this. And he will, he will say, okay, I'll read it. He'll leave it right on his coffee table next to his couch on the TV. And he will just watch the TV and the book will be sitting right there. Right? And the whole time he knows the wife is watching him, saying, why aren't you reading that book? She can, he can feel her judgment. It's now the third book. <laughs> so 
So every time he's turning the TV, he is gritting his teeth because he knows he has to read that book. Otherwise, there's going to be trouble. But he's not going to read the book because what happened? The last two times he read the book, it got worse. The last two times he read the book, they got in a fight. Right? How many experienced this one? Oh, you guys are bad liars. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I got to focus now. Hold on. Gotta focus. <laughs> so when, when in that cycle, the husband is ignoring her and this book because he feels it as a condemnation upon him. That he is an unloving man when he is out breaking his back to serve her, when he is out breaking his back to f provide for the family, and when if an intruder come, he will fight that intruder to the death. He will go risk his life to kill that man who is trying to kill his wife. How many women forget about that? That your husband has the responsibility, that he has the actual scary responsibility that if there's an intrusion on your house, he risks his life to protect you. How many know that? Okay, I know, I know here we got ladies with firearms, so I know. <laughs> right? <laughs> Almost all the ladies are armed here, so. But um, the man also has to have, he also has that weight on his shoulder. You know, when your husband is not at home and now you have the weight of the shoulder on your shoulder, what if an intruder comes in and now you have to fight that man? You have to now fight that man. You, you understand that is a stress load on you. you. You understand that, right? A husband has that at all times because he loves you. Because he cherishes your family, the family. Even though he doesn't look like he's thinking about it, he has that in the back of his head all the time to protect you. It is a godly instinct. But it does not come just because he is actively trying to do that because he loves you. So we have to give him credit for that. Amen? We have to give the man credit for that. He will risk his life for you, but give him credit. Respect him. This is the cycle. Without love, she reacts without respect. Without respect, he reacts without love. Without love, she reacts without respect. Without respect, he reacts without love. Without love, she reacts with res without respect. Without respect, he reacts without love. And this cycle will continue and your marriage will break down and you will be living in a hell. I have seen so many marriages that are living in literal hell because they continue this cycle. So as you are now beginning commencing your marriages, it is so important that you do not fall into this cycle. And when you do, you fall out of it as fast as you can. Amen? Get out of it as fast as you can. This will destroy your marriage. It is the primary tool of Satan to kill you, to maim you, and to destroy you. Right? That's what the scripture says Satan is out to do. He is like a roaring lion to kill, maim, and destroy you. And he will be after your marriage. This is the heaven cycle or the energizing cycle. If she feels love, his love will motivate her respect and her respect will motivate his love. His love will motivate her respect. Her respect will motivate his love. His love will motivate her respect. Her, her respect will motivate his love. This is the energizing cycle. This is the heavenly cycle. This is the cycle we want to get on. In our daily lives, all we have to do, remember, is love and respect. There's not five steps or five ways to rebuke the devil. You got the word of God right there. Love your wife. Wife, respect your husband. It's literally that simple. And it will be nuanced in every facet of your life as you live together. But that's the principle. Husbands, unconditionally love your wife. Wives, unconditionally respect your husband. Husband, even though your wife is unlovable, love her. That's how you change her. Well, no, 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 no money. <laughs> you want to answer that, Joel? <laughs> he got, we know he got blessing on him. <laughs> right? Especially when there is no money. Men need to feel your respect, ladies. If he has no money and he feels like a loser and everybody is condemning him in the world and he comes home and feels condemned, he is dying. The man is dying. It is in that time where the wife can come to his rescue. 
You can come to your man's rescue. You can save his life. You can come to him and say, I believe in you. You are my man. We went through hurdles and obstacles together, and we will get through this one because God is willing and God is able. <laughs> Especially when you have no money. When I got kicked out of the palace, I got no money either. You understand? But my wife believed in me. She believed in me. And she stood by my side. So husbands, we change our wife lovingly with love. That's how we change her. We don't change her like how you change another guy. You know? It's like you're, you know, you're... Your boys. You don't change your wife like you try to change your guy, you know, your boys. Amen. You don't go up to her and say, look, man, I really, you know, I think this is this, this totally screwed up. You don't do that. You don't do that to me. That's messed up. You don't do that to me. You don't speak like that to me. You know, we don't, you don't, that's not the way to, to, to work it out with your wife. That's how you work it out with your guys. Amen. <laughs> You work it out lovingly. I like to say, you have to love barbecue. Who likes barbecue? What do you do when you barbecue some baby back ribs? <laughs> you, got to marry, you got to lather it in barbecue sauce? Are you using a steel brush? Are you using a, a what's that brush? You're using a steel brush or a, a bristle brush? A soft brush? You're using a soft brush. Are you lathering it? Are you just throwing it in there? Are you lathering it? Then when you cook it, what, are you cooking it fast or you do slow cook? Okay. You understand what I'm saying, man. When you, you got to do the love barbecue. You know how to make some baby back ribs. That's how you got to make some baby back rib for your wife. She is the greatest baby back rib for you from heaven. Amen. So you got to cook it slow. You got to lather it. You got to smother it in that ray, what is that? Ooh, sugar ray, citrus, barbe sweet barbecue. Woo, right? <laughs> now I got the Holy Ghost. Now I, now I got the Holy Ghost. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Wives, change your husband respectfully. Don't go to your man and talk to him like you talk to your girlfriends. You will drive him crazy. He will run from you. <laughs> do not go to him and talk to him like you do to your girlfriends. Okay, he doesn't want to hear about the mother-in-law and the auntie and the, the problem with the, this car and that issue and, and, that, and Maria is going through that. He doesn't want to hear that. You got to get to the point. <laughs> right, man? Uh, ladies? This is what I call the respectful recipe. When you make a recipe list, it doesn't go on for 50 pages, right? When you're trying to explain a recipe to somebody, you don't give them 50 pages of recipe. Amen? You certainly do not talk about Maria's problems or Martha's problems. You talk about the ingredients that you're gonna use in that recipe, right? And you can't just say, throw some beans in there. What kind of beans? We're gonna use pinto beans, black beans. What other kind of beans are there? Kidney beans, what else? Huh? Bla Navy beans, what are we gonna use? Tell me specific, amen? Be specific. Be specific. When you try to change your man with respect, think about the recipe, ladies. The recipe. Keep it short, clear, very lucid. He knows what you're talking about. He knows what identified. He can go and buy the red kidney beans. He doesn't have to stand in front of the bean aisle and say, which beans am I, do I have to buy? He can go to the red kidney beans, pick them out, and get the next ingredient. Amen. Why are you laughing, ladies? Okay. 
So keep, this is what my wife does. I'll tell you what my wife does. She shows me respect. When she has something I need to change that she feels pulled on her spirit, she comes to me, she says, can I speak with you uh, at, tomorrow at 9 o'clock? And it will be 10 minutes. She tells me when, and then I'll say, oh, sure, yeah, we can meet after, you know, 9 o'clock tomorrow. We're working on stuff. See, when men are working on things, even though they're, it looks like they're, you know, uh, whatever, watching football or playing video, whatever it is, they're actually thinking about other things. If they have to get something, a job done, they're thinking on that, but they're just trying to rest their brain for a couple seconds before they get back on that. So it's not like they're just, what is it? Mark Unger says, the men in their head have a box, many boxes, and the most important box is the do nothing box. <laughs> what are you doing? Nothing. <laughs> what do you think about? Nothing. <laughs> men have a no, doing nothing box. You got to respect it. What you doing? Nothing. Oh, okay. I can respect that. <laughs> He's going to be like, whoa, praise God. Okay. So this is what my wife does. She comes to me. She doesn't say, I need to talk to you now. I'm in the middle of something, right? How many men have encountered this? We need to talk now. I'm in the middle of something. I'm answering an email, right? Or I'm doing this. I'm in the middle. Or, you know, I don't play video games, but some men love video games. Okay? Some men love video games. And maybe they're resting their head as they're, because they've been all day cramming their brain on something. So just let them play the video game. It's not a big deal. Let them play a little bit. Ask them, honey, I need to, can we talk tomorrow or can we talk tonight at 9 for 10 minutes? That's what my wife does for me. She shows me that respect. And when she meets me, you know what she does? She sets up her clock. She puts the clock in front of us. She puts the timer on 10 minutes. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? How many men would, would love that? Okay. You cannot promise a man, I'm only going to go 10 minutes and go two hours. Because now, he can't trust you. He can't trust when they make that promise. So if, if the ladies, like my wife does, she will set the time, set the date, and she will show me that she's serious about this issue, but serious, she, that she, serious about my time as well. Amen? You're putting too much expectation uh, on me. <laughs> <laughs> That's what she does. I am so grateful that my anointed wife does that to me, she, that she will respect me in that manner. See, so there are small things we can do, but in the end, it is the respect cycle, right? It is loving our, spouse, our wife unconditionally, being the priest of the household, studying the scripture, being the leader of the house, spiritual leader as well, going and covering your, your spouse with the word of God, watering. It says, wash her with water as the word of God. And in the other way, wives also to unconditionally respect our husbands. This is what we do not hear in this third wave, postmodern, you know, feminist, saturated ideology, ideological world. We never hear that. But the scripture shows us the true answer to creating strong marriages. If we obey it, we have the answer right there. One, now the third thing that we need to talk about quickly is absolute sex in marriage. Your sexuality in marriage is critical to your marriage. How many know your children will come from your sexuality in marriage? Your descendants will come from that sexuality in marriage. But we have become so conditioned by Satan's kingdom that we are, we do not, we cannot talk about the sanctity of sexuality in marriage, even in the churches. This is how we become so weak as the body of Christ, that we're not even able to instruct families on the importance of sexuality in their marriage. In fact, it is the greatest gift it is the most coveted and precious gift God gives us. Amen? It is a grace as well. It's not something we deserve or we earn. It is something God gives us to our marriage, to unite us. What did the scripture say? 
the two will become one flesh. That is the mystery of God, is what Paul said. Isn't that what he said? There is a power there. There is an anointing there. Your absolute sex life should be strong. It should be abundant. There should be prosperity there. It should not be barren. If it's barren, something's wrong, folks, right? <laughs> Something is wrong. We've got to get off some cycles and get onto the heavenly cycle to build up, to build up the abundance in that marriage. Amen? This is so important. I think it's underestimated how important your absolute sex life is. For men, it is the primary place. It is the greatest way that we feel totally loved, totally accepted, totally embraced. It is the greatest, greatest way that we feel like a, that we are living as a son of God. It is that powerful as the glue to your marriage. However, at the same time, I see so many people try to use the scripture or Father's words to say, we have to do it three times a week, and that's the law. <laughs> God freed us from the law. It's not, it's not like we have, to, we're not trying to force our, the health of our absolute success life, Right? We are trying to create that and manifest the environment where the Holy Spirit and God can be present when we come together as husband and wife. How many know there is the Holy Spirit, the presence of God is there when husband and wife come together in one, but one heart, one, of one mind, one heart, one accord, and in one body. Amen? One flesh. There is a Holy Spirit anointing that you will find like you will find like nowhere else. I don't care what church you go to, when you are with your spouse in the embrace of full trust, love, and vulnerability, and absolute sex life is powerful and abundant, there is no more powerful anointing, no more powerful motivator for you to go out and defeat Satan. Amen? Amen? Ladies, stop thinking men are perverts. They're not perverts. That's how much they want you. That's how much they want you. Amen? Men are, no, men are not God made men that way. So we can chase you. <laughs> so we can hunt you. <laughs> not to kill you, but to love you with everything we have. Okay, when your absolute sex life, which is the gift from God to your marriage, because now Satan has no claim on your marriage, right? After the blessing, after, after uh, the three-day ceremony, Satan has no claim on your marriage. He has no claim on your intimacy. It is totally separated and it is in the presence of God. So our absolute sex life is the full expression of oneness in Christ and your joyous absolute sex life and the romantic positive energy that that will create in your family will be the greatest gift you give to your descendants. It is the greatest gift. When you have a powerful absolute sex marriage, you are giving your children the greatest blessing, the greatest blessing. How many know teenage suicide, all those things with psychological disease, all related primarily, most, mostly to parental dysfunction, right? But when you have a powerful, anointed man and woman of God who are coming together, who are powerful in their abundance, in their absolute sex life, who is powerful in creating that energy of of, of, of intimacy and joy unspeakable, woo, your children will reap the blessings of that. They will want to get blessed. They will have a model in their head to work off of when they get married. Amen? How many times, you saw in the scripture this weekend, right? We don't fight for the victory. We, want, we fight from the victory. 
We fight from the victory, right? If your children have a victorious parents who are powerful in their absolute sex marriage, they're fighting from a victory. You've already made them empowered and they already have the victory of you so that now when they get blessed and they get faced by Satan's attack, now they can fight from the victory, not for their own victory. They're fighting from your victory. Amen? That's how powerful your marriage is. That's how powerful your intimacy is. It will have impact on your children. It will absolutely have impact on your children. Right? We talk about absolute sex all the time with our children. Openly. Because we don't want some... Person, you know, some progressive teaching them about sexuality. Right? We want them to learn from their parents and the gift that God has given us in marriage. Right? We don't want to wait until they're learning it from MTV and who, who else? These stars. Lady Gaga and what else? Who? Right? What? B whatever it is. Wherever they're learning it, we, don't, we want to root it in God. Amen? And this joyous life of the absolute sex marriage, the power that creates and the joy that it creates, husbands, as you romance your wife, as you chase after her, you will create an incredible energy that your children will be fed off of and strengthened in when now they are getting blessed. It, is, it has repercussions beyond your personal relationship with your spouse because you are fulfilling the word of God in life. And because you are standing obedient to the word of God, God is blessing your generations. Amen? That's what the word said. He is blessing your generations and your children will be blessed. Amma, you want to say something quickly about that real quick? This is not working. Okay. Thank you so much. Let us give one more round of applause to my husband. Thank you so much. You know, he bragged about me too much. I don't know I can live up to that expectation. I have to think of pray about that. Um, you know, I, I just want to make a, just a quick point about the, um, you know, the crazy cycle. With, uh, uh, without love, she reacts. Without respect, without respect, she reacts. Without love, right? He, he reacts, okay. That, that cycle, that crazy cycle. You know, women, um, we nag because we care, actually. <laughs> that, that is absolute true. I mean, I, I know men don't understand this, but we, we nag because we care. If we don't care, we're not going to even nag. Okay, who are you? I don't, I don't have to even care about you. But we nag because we care. And, and many of, most of our lady here can agree with that. So men, when your wife nag, please understand that's a cue. Oh, she needs a love. Okay, that's like a, that's very important cue that she's giving to you. So, but, you know, the, the, another side is uh, when women nag to men, men actually think that's a um, sign of uh, contempt, right? Hatred. Oh, she hates me. Oh, here she, it goes again. She doesn't trust me. That's why she nags. You know, she thinks I'm a kid or something. That's why she nags. See? But it's a, it's a, that, that, that point, we really have to understand how man is coming, where man is coming from, where woman is coming from. It is actually so true. You know, my husband said, he said 10 minutes, you know, I, I make an appointment with him and I do 10 minutes. Actually, it's a 30 minutes, okay? So he's giving me clue that I have to reduce into 10 minutes. I got it, husband. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I do actually do that. My, I take out my iPhone, I make a schedule with him, I put it in my iPhone schedule list, and I put out my iPhone in 30 minutes, and then I press the start. <laughs> and I, I try to finish it within 30 minutes. Okay, I'll work on that, okay, I'll work on that. <laughs> always finish, always finish on time. <laughs> And you know what, actually, and another thing we do, I do with my husband is uh, because we do ministry together, there's uh, not only the family matter, but also there's a, uh, uh, you know, ministry matter too. Okay, this person won, um, you know, make an appointment, there's something needs to be done. And 
I actually emailed to him. He's right there. He's right in front of me. <laughs> He's right in front of me doing something. But I email him and I make a list and I email him and then and that's how he responds to me in terms of work, ministry work. So that's the reason I do that is it's more uh, effective. It's more effective, and I don't have to, you know, uh, get into him emotionally or how can you not be so care about this person? This person is in hospital, and how can you just, you know, do something else when this is urgent? I don't have to get into that, and I just simply get into the get to the work, get to the point, and that's a respect recipe, right? That's we we just we just talked about it, and ladies, you know, and uh, men, you know what? I know you guys have uh, something that you want to fix about, you know, your wife and something that is not really lovable. But, you know, put it in the, you know, those barbecues and it has to be between the bun, those sandwich bun, right? You know, you have to, you have to make your wife prepare that something is coming. Something, you know, the bun it has to be soft, right? You know, uh, <laughs> and if it's butter, that's even nicer, right? <laughs> a little bit of season on top of it. So brothers and sisters, <laughs> you know, we talked about many things, many things, but you know, I really believe our blessing come from God. I think that's the most important point. You know, our blessing will, will we have to hold on and centered on God. And whenever you are, your struggle, go back to the scripture and what scripture told you. We have to respect our husband unconditionally and husband respect his wife, uh, love his wife unconditionally. And handsome husband, it's your turn to close it. <laughs> Amen. Thank you. Um, uh, let's give her a <laughs> big you. round of applause, everybody. Thank you. And we want to start the holy wine ceremony. So please, uh, attendants, can you prepare the holy wine now? Let's prepare the holy wine now. And you know, one of the things that is so important is to, as husband and wife, pray together. Please pray together. When you're going through stuff and you can't work it out, we're the priests of the household, man. We go to our wife and say, honey, let's pray about this. We can't seem to break through. We can't seem to communicate or you can't understand what I'm saying. I can't. Let's pray about it. Let's pray together. Bring God in. This is God's covenant. Amen? This is God's marriage. Lead your wife to prayer. Right? Stand in prayer with her. Stand in prayer with her. You will see a tremendous shift. A tremendous shift in the spirit. Okay, let's prepare those. Uh, yeah, let's prepare the whole wine, everybody. Okay, yeah. Tell the, uh, yes, can we pray? Okay, so having prayer in our lives is so, so important. We're going to now um, take the holy wine. Um, I'm going to have the attendants come down. I'd like you all to stand and stretch out a little bit. You guys have been awesome and uh, sitting for, you know, a couple minutes. Just 10 minutes, don't worry about it. I had the clock going, you were just sitting 10 minutes. <laughs> okay. And let's prepare that. Let's prepare the uh, holy wine ceremony, please, attendance. And um, the we'll take a little break after we take the wine. We'll take the we'll take a little break, and then uh, we will come back. We will come back. Let's say right now it's it is eleven thirty. So let's say we come back at eleven forty-five. Is that okay? We'll come back at eleven forty-five. Everybody, take a bathroom break. Do what you have to do. We'll come back then, and then we'll actually uh, we'll, we will then proceed with the blessing. We have to change clothes and everything, and so we will do that. The attendants will help you with the holy wine and everything else. And what a beautiful day! Let's give our couples one more time a great round of applause as they stand now, prepare for the covenant. Amen. Amen. Give your spouse a hug, guys. Give your spouse a hug. Tell them. Tell them, we are one. In God. Amen. 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 Okay, please bring the holy wine. Let's have the couples take the holy wine. The holy wine is the transferring of our blood lineage. The lineage that was lost at the fall of man to come under the children of God became the children of the devil, of Satan. And so the holy wine represents the blood of Christ. To engraft us back onto the blood of Christ. Onto the blood of Christ. So that the blood of Christ is not only covering you, okay? 
But the blood of Christ, right here, we have these, we'll have everybody do this. But the blood of Christ is within you, within you. The blood of Christ, what is, which is what? It is the blood of God. It is the lineage of God. And that is, that is what we become as we take the holy wine. So please take the holy wine in your hands now. Okay? Amma. So the wife, uh, the wife will take, please face each other, please face each other. Okay, and the wife, and the, and the wife will, pan, will have half of the cup. Okay, so the wife will have half. I'm sorry, we could we wanted to pour you more wine. Okay, don't get upset. We just want you to be able to participate and not be doing drunken monkey kung fu on the stage. Okay, so so half. Yes, half half. Uh, uh, the wife will take half. If you're alone and you have your wife uh, there in the spirit with you, or, or she's participating from a different country, the kachiyama, the husband, will take half on her behalf. First, in that position, okay? So the wife now may proceed to take half of the holy wine, please. Praise God. Praise. Let's give them a big round of applause, everybody. Come on, let's give God some praise. <laughs> praise God, okay? Now, please transfer the cup to your husband. Give it to him now. And the husband now will take the rest of the holy wine, the blood of Christ, blood of Christ, amen, and adieu, amen. Let's give God some praise, everybody. Let's give him some praise. <laughs> Woo! Yes. Okay, so we will take now a 15-minute break, folks, and we will come back. I'll see you at 1145, and we will begin the blessing from then. God bless you. God bless you. Beautiful, beautiful. <laughs>